This is a Hot Pie Original. Uh, this is different and this is cool and it's not different and cool just because it's a rock star talking about rock star things. It's an amazing life and a worthwhile charity. And the backstory is off the charts cool for those that have not seen the documentary about John Kay and Steppenwolf. I suggest you check it out. He is with me now. Uh, John, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. How about me? Can yep. you hear me all right? I can. Perfect. Uh, listen, for everybody's, everyone else right now, you know the songs, but not many of you know the full story. John Kay formed the band Steppenwolf and was the lead singer, but the backstory and his life story is even more amazing, and that's why you should watch the the documentary Steppenwolf sold more than 25 million records worldwide, uh, seven gold albums, one platinum album, 13 Billboard Hot 100 singles, seven were top 40 hits, three in the top 10, Born to be Wild, Magic Carpet Ride, and Rock Me, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I think this was the first song, I, John can correct me on this, but the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame selected Born to be Wild as one of its first five singles that shaped rock and roll, and that was song by itself was put into the Rock Hall of Fame. Is that right, John? That's the was that, that the first correct, rock and roll yeah. song ever to be put in? Well, it was. I think there were two other songs that were part of that induction, along with "Born to Be Wild." One of them was "Rumble" by Link Ray, amazing uh, instrumental. And the other one, I think, was "Louie Louie," but I'm not sure about oh, the third one. Is that but right? That, uh, I, I want I want you to have a chance to talk about your charitable cause because it's it's important. But I, you know, all of us want to know rock and roll from rock and roll stars. Um, and I think arguably your band was super successful at arguably the most important time in musical history. But for people that don't know your backstory, is it Yo Kim Fritz? Fritz, am I saying that correctly? My given name was Joachim, okay. uh, which like the Spanish version would be Joaquin. Joachim and the, my father's name Fritz was my middle name and Kaladat was my, la uh, my surname. And that <laughs> was an abbreviation of the original Lithuanian name because my background is from my father's side Lithuanian and from my mother's side French Huguenot and German. Um, I was born in what was then still part of Germany called East Prussia. My father was killed in Russia before I was born. My mother took me in her arms as a baby and headed west because the Russians were about to overrun uh, where we lived. Uh, I then grew up in what became communist East Germany for the first five years of my life. My mother and I then escaped, managed to get across to West Germany. She met a good man who had survived five years in a Russian prisoner of war camp and married. And while that was going on, I discovered rock and roll, and that was courtesy of the American Armed Forces Radio Network. See, anyway, I, I, that, that was going to be the obvious question. How does a kid behind the wall in the Eastern Bloc, occupied no less, get into, get access to rock and roll music? Well, I didn't. Uh, it was unthinkable at, at that time. In other words, the the the. Uh, Communist regime later down the line when rock and roll in the mid 50s became, you know, something that the kids in West Germany went crazy over, myself included, once I got there. But uh, the communists never liked the Western influence and tried to block radio airwaves and all sorts of stuff. But of course, at age five, when I finally got out of there with my mother, uh, I was too young to know any of that. It was while growing up in West Germany that when I was roughly 11, maybe 12, I heard Little Richard, Elvis, you know, the usual pioneers of rock and roll and became kind of a childhood uh, fantasy daydream, you know, sure, someday I will be on the other side of the ocean and learn how to speak English and all of that. But as it turned out in 58, my mother, stepdad and I immigrated to Toronto, Canada. Uh, I had been uh, designated as being legally blind uh, because I have very poor vision. And so the Canadian National Institute for the Blind loaned me a tape recorder, which I immediately pressed into service to record my first 
you know, feeble attempts at playing guitar and singing. But from there, things developed as time went on. And of course, eventually, Steppenwolf was created um, in Los Angeles in 1967. And uh, the wolf had its ups and downs and triumphs and disappointments. But towards uh, many years later, uh, during our first, um, uh, my wife and I met in Toronto while I was part of a Canadian band there. And she and I have been together since October 1965. And uh, so we're a real partnership team. And during one of our first trips to uh, Asia, actually, uh, we were in Cambodia, we saw the killing fields, we got involved in building a school there. One thing led to another, later that year was our first visit to Africa. And that was a turning point because after seeing the beauty of Kenya and Tanzania and all the wild creatures there, we decided that our newly formed little foundation would focus on supporting those who, unlike some of us who have been seeking the spotlight, had dedicated their lives to something greater than themselves. And it's been really humbling uh, to witness some of these people's efforts. And so we, meaning my uh, wife, Yuta and I, uh, we have been as best as we can. Uh, I wish we were in the price range of Bill and Melinda Gates and we would be, you know, um, uh, giving millions every year, but, um, you know, every dollar matters. And so for the last 15 years, that's been the focus in our lives. Um, we put Steppenwolf um, into retirement. Last gig was played in October 2018. And of course, I was doing some solo appearances uh, to kind of offset that. But then came the virus and uh, everything was put on hold for a while. Yeah, if, if let's go back in time because it seems as if, you, you correct me, it seems as if almost... Every great rocker from a great rock generation mentions Little Richard. It seems like this, I mean, I know we know about the blues and the blues having an influence. It seems over and over again, Little Richard is mentioned uh, with, with rock and roll legends. Well, R Little Richard, you know, here's a kid, me, about 11 years old, not speaking English yet. And I hear this, this little Richard thing, long, tall, Sally, whatever it was, and didn't understand a word. As it turns out, there was not all that much to understand. It was more about the whole incredible energy and this sort of, um, I don't know how to describe it. It gave me literally chicken skin from head to toe. And I want more of that. And others were delivering those kind of things, too. The first poet of rock and roll, Chuck Berry, and all of his great records, and you know, it was just something that I, that, um, I was preoccupied with and spent all of my waking hours either trying to learn how to play guitar or listening to records or radio. Once I was in Toronto, uh, Buffalo, New York was only 100 miles away. I could get their television as well as their radio stations. And it was there that on Sunday mornings I heard black church services gospel music. That was another thing that really caught my ear. So I was getting kind of an education as I went along. I eventually, uh, for roughly a year, was in Buffalo. This was during the early folk music revival of the 60s, uh, early 60s. And another folk, he said, well, if you really want to learn where the stuff came from, go to the music library downtown, rather to the library, main library. They have a music section. And all of the... Library of Congress recordings made by John and Alan Lomax in the field are in there. And you can take some of those albums home and exchange them every week, which I did. And it was through that process that I learned about McKinley Morganfield. Who's that? Well, he's better known as Muddy Waters. And, you know, many other discoveries. Sun House, of course, eventually Robert Johnson and so on. So I was constantly absorbing influences uh, particularly Delta Blues, and, of course, once I attended the uh, Newport Folk Festival in 64 and 5 when Dylan went electric, I also was inspired by the young singer-songwriters following in the footsteps of Woody Guthrie, who had something to say, because this was the time 
when young black and white civil rights wor uh, workers were murdered in Mississippi. This was the time when young people were uh, drafted uh, to be shipped off to Vietnam. So there was a lot of stuff going on that was reflected in the song lyrics of some of the writers, such as, you know, Phil Oakes and Richard Farina and, uh, you know, Dylan, of course. And that was another influence on me. You know, you, the, the songs that you wrote, I mean, these are legendary classic rock songs, obviously born to be wild. Did you write those? Were you writing them knowing that they were going to be counterculture or do you just write songs in a rock and roll frame of mind make it, do you make the music first or the lyrics first? And did you know, did you have some perspective on, for instance, born to be wild again, that is the ultimate, I, you, you can maybe list some others, but the ultimate counterculture rock song. Did you, did you have any well, clue to that? Is that what you wanted to do? Well, it was interesting because, you know, life is so, has so many curveballs coming at you. Yes, I was writing songs, uh, but I did not write uh, Born to be Wild. Uh, it was written by the ex-lead guitarist of the precursor to Steppenwolf, namely a Canadian band I was a member of called The Sparrows. Well, The Sparrows came from Toronto. We got a, a label deal that went nowhere in New York. We played there for a while, wound up on the Sunset Strip in L.A. playing the Whiskey A Go Go and others. Also, for a while, we were in the Bay Area during the period when we befriended, you know, various Bay Area bands. But eventually that band busted up in Los Angeles and from the ashes of the Sparrows, uh, you know, Steppenwolf was formed. Well, the uh, guitarist uh, changed his name to My uh, Mars Bonfire. He was off on his own as a single songwriter and he delivered a, um, a recording of his to our rehearsal uh, to his brother, who was our drummer in Steppenwolf. And we kicked that song around and we thought, well, this is as good as any of the other stuff that we've written so far. Let's make this part of the, the first album that we recorded. Nobody knew uh, what kind of impact that song might have because in fact, it wasn't even uh, released until um, later along the lines. It was the third single off our first album and we had to kind of uh, play a game with the label because they wanted a different song. And so finally we agreed, okay, we would put the single out, not, designa not designating which was the A or B side for radio to play and see if they would play anything. Well, they did. Seven out of 10 stations went with Born to be Wild. And by the time we went on the road in 1968, our first cross country uh, tour, our album was already in the top five nationally before Born to be Wild because the so-called underground FM radio stations, which was a fairly new development at the time. They didn't have Coca-Cola or Chevrolet advertising. They were just some guy smoking weed in the basement of a church with this radio station <laughs> in, in Pasadena. And he would put on, you know, the whole side <laughs> of Steppenwolf's LP, go outside, smoke something else, come back in, flip it over. In other words, the whole album was being played. And so the album was doing extremely well already. And then came Born to be Wild. And that really was like a rocket launch, you know. Uh, from then on, uh, it was just uh, write, re rehearse, record, tour, fly to Europe, do television shows, you know. But, Home life, what's that? Yeah, you know, yeah. Nice. That, that, that formative period, you know, w w you just talked about that formative period. I guess it was the Bay Area, that whole rock scene in that time. Talk about that rock scene at that time. You know, there you are, I guess, making the rounds to clubs and playing the songs. I mean, who, who's around at that time? Um, who's influencing you? You're influencing them. Uh, what, what, what's life like in those formative years of rock and roll bands in the Bay Area? Well, we were uh, the Sparrows, as we were then uh, known. We're in the Bay Area from late summer, early fall of 66 until spring 67. We played a couple of times for Bill Graham. 
uh, but mainly at the Avalon Ballroom, which was run by a, a kind of co-op outfit called the Family Dog. And there we would play with uh, Charlie Muzzlewhite, um, uh, Country Joe and the Fish, Quicksilver Messenger sh Service, the Charlatans, um, etc. And we also played a variety of clubs and uh, the Steve Miller Blues Band. You know, everybody was rubbing shoulders with other people because when you played these uh, ballrooms, there were usually three acts that played, uh, you know, on a Friday and then again on a Saturday. So you're up in the dressing room, and Janis Joplin drops by, and she's got her Southern comfort. And, you know, it was just a very kind of communal thing. We were the new kids on the block. We were not really um, uh, of the uh, San Francisco, era, you know, Bay Area uh, culture. We weren't uh, raised there. But uh, we played, you know, like others, uh, the same venues. We made some friends. Uh, but we also knew that the recording industry on the West Coast was headquartered in Los Angeles. And so after a while, uh, we wanted to try our luck at getting a deal, went back down to L.A. As it turned out, uh, although we had a week-long engagement at a club next to the whiskey on the strip called the Galaxy, the drummer got into a nasty confrontation with the club owner. We got fired. The band broke up. And then you kind of go, now what? You know? Yeah. Well, it turned out that uh, my uh, then still girlfriend, Yuta from Toronto, had finally gotten her immigration visa. She showed up. We moved uh, into a small um, apartment above a garage. And lo and behold, next door, out of nowhere, a girlfriend of hers moves in who had also just gotten married to a record producer. And he heard some of our Sparrow live recordings. He said, put a new band together. I called the ex Sparrows uh, drummer and organist, as well as a couple of local musicians. And we formed Steppenwolf in the summer of 67 and uh, took some demos to the uh, record company, Dunhill Records. The fellow who ran it said, I listened to the demos, you know, John. I'm not sure I get it, but my young daughter really likes it. Maybe she got a better ear. We're going to take a chance. You know, so what, so what we were those? What were those initial songs? Was when, when did Mar uh, Magic Carpet Ride come along? Is that one of the first ones? Magic Carpet Ride uh, uh, came uh, on the heels of the first album and Born to Be Wild, because once the first album was successful and Born to Be Wild was the uh, the big hit off of it. We had, unfortunately, a deal that, you know, we didn't have money for a lawyer or a manager, so we signed what they put in front of us. And the deal was deliver two albums a year, which was fine if you were a crooner uh, and the A&R guy says, listen, we got the arrangements, we got the orchestra, just, you know, sing the lyrics on this uh, uh, music stand. We'll make an album in three or uh, four days and we'll call you in six months and make another one. <laughs> but these were the times when the Beatles and others had learned how to write their own songs, you know, had their whole own uh, uh, musical uh, identity. And so for us to try to do two albums a year while touring and while writing songs on the go and everything else that went with it, it was just totally unrealistic. But we did manage at least to get the second album finished uh, in, uh, towards the end of 68. And the lead off single from that was Magic Carpet Ride, which I co-wrote. And that what's really- that, What's that about? I mean, that is a trip. What's that about? <laughs> well, right? <laughs> right? You know, a lot of, well, the thing is that we would have young, you know, young long hairs come up to us, you know, <laughs> I've got some really good shrooms, man, and I really figured out what Magic Carpet Ride is about. It's about the nebula out past the... No, it's not, dude. Uh, it, was, it was one of those things where we had, we, Yuta and I, had gotten our first royalty checks. So we said, we need a really good stereo system. So we went out and splurged and brought that thing home and set it up in our then still... Cracker Jack's box, a little apartment, and uh, the the wolf. You know, we were in the studio cutting new tracks, 
And we had come up with something that was really rooted in our bass player's riff. Boom, boom, da da dum 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 da da dum 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 And it was, oh, that's kind of cool. Let's kick that around. And we did. And we came up with a instrumental track. And I said uh, to our producers and, you know, so I said, I have an idea for that. Make me a little cassette tape, which they did. I took it home. And so I put that cassette into our brand new stereo system, you know, playback, big speakers. And in 20 minutes, it just popped into my head. I like to dream between my sound machine on, on a cloud of sound, a drift in the light. Of course, there were some later, even in radio, who were hesitant saying, it's a drug song. No, when Steppenwolf wants a drug song, you know it's a drug <laughs> song. To put you know, the pusher yeah. was an anti-drug song. Yeah. Don't Step on the Grass, Sam, one of Spiro Agnew's favorites, was also a drug song. So we don't hide our drug references. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that time, though, you guys are starting to become a big deal. Other artists at that time, that, you know, even you stood back and said, wow, they, you know, that, that person kicks ass, that band kicks ass. At that time, who were you running around with and who was, who was coming up at the same time? Because those are influential rock times. We were a bit of an insular um, uh, outfit, you know, concentrating on trying to get the job done, as it were. But in the Bay Area, as I mentioned, still the Sparrows, we befriended different people, Steve Miller and others. When we were back in L.A., there were, of course, the Doors. Um, you know, the Birds had already a year or two prior to that made an impact. And, uh, you know, we all, Steppenwolf members, when the royalties came in, we all bought, you know, decent cars and <laughs> a nice little house to live in. So we were busy being, I mean, my daughter was born while I was on stage for Bill Graham in San Francisco. You know, I mean, that's how busy we were, up and down. Yeah. And when yeah. we um, got, you know, the people who really influenced me, we listened to everybody. There were lots of contemporaries, bands and solo artists that had, had unique qualities that I was attracted to. But in terms of being influenced, I was influenced primarily by the masters of the blues, you know, Howlin' Wolf. Muddy Waters, and even some of the, the early uh, acoustic uh, guys from the Delta Sun House, you know, Robert Johnson, who influenced people like Eric Clapton, uh, Jimmy Page, you know, the list is endless. Uh, I spoke to Eric Burden one time, you know, same thing, him growing up in the UK, me growing up in West Germany. These records from the States were little treasures, you know, that uh, was astounding. Uh, but there were other things going on during that period that were part of the times. You know, I remember going to Hawaii for the first time. We were still somewhat approachable at this point, you know, security guards and so on. We're playing for these long-haired Hawaiian kids, and I see a dozen or so young guys with no hair. And I talked to them afterwards. He said, well, we just came back from Vietnam. But we know your music because we buy the cassettes at the PX and we take the music with us into the bush. You know, there's little battery operated single speaker cassette deck radio jobs. And it was, I, I said, this is the first rock and roll war. These people are in Vietnam, in the jungle, listening to Creedence Clearwater and Steppenwolf and Cream and Hendrix and others. Uh, and when we were on our first cross-country tour in 68, in April, King was assassinated. In the summer, Robert Kennedy was killed. In later that uh, summer, there were these enormous uh, street battles in Chicago at the Democratic uh, Convention, you know, with young protesters uh, shouting, the whole world is watching. I mean, these were volatile, volatile times, and we were playing to our peers with what was on our mind. And quite honestly, one of the more rewarding aspects of doing what we did over the years was when others uh, who listened to our music and appreciated it came up to us and said, you have given us a voice. 
your lyrics uh, re uh, reflect what concerns me. And that song, this and that and the other one, is my personal anthem. You know, that was the deep connection that enabled us through the ups and downs and the craziness of the music business to not just survive, but thrive, you know, for 50 years. John, why? It sounds like a simple question, but I'm sure the, I mean, the answer is going to be very complex. You guys are hugely successful and hugely successful through a fairly small window, and then you break up. Why, why, do, why do bands break up? Why can't well, I, I know, you know? I know that's a generalization, but but we all now know. Oh man, those guys are at their peak. Why does it not work? What happens to you guys? Well, at the beginning, and I'm I'm generalizing because the following may not apply for everybody, obviously, but certainly it did uh, to Steppenwolf to some degree. At the beginning, when you're a garage band or whatever, uh, you know, it's the three musketeers, or in our case, the five musketeers. It's all for one and one for all. And then you realize when the success comes with the money, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the various aspects of different egos and personalities emerge. You have to keep in mind that our guitar player in the original uh, lineup was 17 years old. <laughs> you know, uh, and so uh, insufficient sleep, too many uh, drugs, uh, you know, constant, um, so after a while, there was an attrition in, in the band. The 17-year-old uh, Michael Monarch, a great little, you know, he, he's still a great guy. He uh, couldn't really handle the, the requirements of discipline and everything, you know, that goes with being on the road and showing up on time and everything else. He left on his own volition. Uh, we got a great replacement in the form of Larry Byron, who was a multi-instrumentalist. Uh, but, you know, through over time, different members were replaced because, in some instances, conduct unbecoming even that of a rock and roll musician. <laughs> what the hell could that be, man? <laughs> how do you, get kicked, oh, how how do you have be in such, in such bad behavior you get kicked out of Steppenwolf? Yeah, well, I... We, we shall uh, re let the offending parties remain nameless. <laughs> but the point is that the, the, uh, uh, there were things going on that were um, not really helpful in terms of having cohesion, uh, you know, in the band. And by the time, well, the, let's see, 70, what was that? I'm trying to place this. Might have been, it must have been around 70, 71. I was burned out. I was the primary songwriter in the band. I had a daughter that hadn't seen me for months at a time. And I felt the pressure of, uh, you know, uh, produce and write and write. And, and uh, there's another album we're committed to, to deliver. And I said, I want that pressure off my shoulders. And, I, you know, so in the, uh, at that time, I, I disbanded the band. And, uh, however, uh, about 18 months later, can't remember exactly the term, there was a, a, an offer for Steppenwolf to do a European farewell tour. I said, well, I'll do that if my own band can be the opening act. That way I can recruit European audience for my new album. And so we went over there. But it was a good thing because not only was it very successful, but the Steppenwolf members, we all agreed that time off was a good thing. We had started writing stuff. When we returned to the States, we uh, got a new label deal, new management. And for the mid-70s, we recorded three new Steppenwolf albums. But it went on from there, ups and downs. Um, were you, were you know, we, all, we all hear the horror stories, but we all also assume that in their peak period, a super successful act is going to make a lot of money. Were you making a lot of money or were you getting screwed over? Oh, no. With the, I have to be fair to the um, involved uh, uh, parties. Uh, nobody ran off with our royalties to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Peru or something. Uh, <clears throat> we, we, we had uh, um, competent management. We had uh, uh, money coming in. No question about that. Uh, and it, it, that was not a, a starvation situation where you had to work because you couldn't pay the rent by any means. It was that we were on a wave, successful wave of a career, 
And so the idea is, why would we quit? You know, why would we not? And it was really personal reasons of where I wanted some breathing uh, space, you know. But, that, you know, uh, in that time, when you me. talked about the, the drugs and everything, I mean, you're a guy who is... I believe been married to the same person for fifty some odd years. You seem put together. You're you, you look fine. You sound fine. Um, you were a star during a period of the creation of other stars, and you had to watch them die. I mean, it, it, in a short period of time, you're running around with the Doors, and and Jim Morrison dies. Joplin, Hendrix. Uh, does that scare you straight, or was that just a is it a product of the times? And you happen to live through it. John McClellan is the co-founder and creator of ATX Hot Sauce, now in all 50 states and several retail outlets as well. So what we're going to do today is we're going to let this social media rock star chef uh, walk us through four different sauces, and then I'll taste and we'll tell everyone why they should buy. You can give the science behind yeah. these, and then I'll make the uh, the simple recommendation. Go to atxhotsauce.com. All right, I don't so think let's anybody's go. heard the website. Yeah, I know. I know. You, Jeff, <laughs> I've never heard that. Is atxhotsauce.com. I'll say it three hundred forty forty five times. Atxhotsauce.com. So let's do it. Uh, I brought four flavors here, and we're going to test your palate today. Okay. And I only brought four because I didn't think you could handle five yeah. or six. Yes, fair probably enough. a smart move. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the first one we're going to try here is called Beat Heat. And just like the name implies, beet. It, beet, it has beets in it. It's made with red Fresno peppers. Red Fresnos are uh, red peppers that are uh, they're hotter than a jalapeno and a little bit less than a serrano. So not super hot here, uh, just a lot of good, really good flavor. So we're going to start All with right. this one, and then we're going to move up the chain. Okay. I've had the beet heat, but okay. Yeah, we're going to try it, though. We're it, goes try well, it, it goes well with a cab. All right, Jeff's savoring beet I'll heat. I'll even do it with you, so that should be all right. Now, remember, it is hot sauce. Yeah. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's hot sauce. Trust me, man. Wait, that one, is that one hot to you? Um, no, no, no. A little. Yeah. The, no. the great thing with the fermentation process is you get a bunch of the flavor right up front. Yeah. And then the heat comes, but then it dissipates pretty quickly, especially with the red Fresnos. You know, this is not a very spicy uh, one, but it is um, a very tasty one. goes on great on sandwiches. <laughs> Beet heat. Beet heat. B-E-E-T. Heat. All right, go to atxhotsauce.com. That's right. Well, it's a good question because my uh, situation was somewhat different than uh, many other musicians. It wasn't uh, one of those hand me the guitar and point me to the stage. I always felt as the leader of the band that uh, I had a responsibility, not just to the band members, but their families as well. So my drug use was limited to... Uh, smoking a joint at night after, you know, uh, work was done, so to speak. There was, of course, as one of the great Texans, Kinky Friedman, put it, <laughs> I love Kinky uh, Friedman. an abundance of Peruvian <laughs> marching powder <laughs> that uh, all of us uh, probably should have stayed away from. Yeah. But I never yeah. stuck a needle in my arm. I was never debilitated to, to the point where I couldn't uh, function. And uh, so consequently, uh, the drugs were truly rec recreational. Now, I knew Jimmy, uh, you know, through a couple of meetings and spending a little time with him and, and Janice uh, just through, you know, backstage meetings. Um, and I was very sorry to see both of them go. Uh, they were exemplary of all too many cases of where the drugs took their toll uh, if they didn't kill you outright, they diminished you to the point where your creativity was, you know, uh, gone. And so, you know, that's your plane. Yeah, yeah, fire. In, yeah. In that time, I mean, you're again, you're in that time. It is go, go, go. It is li live the life. Were you was your band or you and other bands? Is it a time period in which you guys know these tragedies are happening? You know these are su successful people. You're probably all in the same age range, and you're living this life together, going up through the ranks together, and you're hearing about these tragedies. Is it talked about? I mean, what is the reaction within the rock and roll world as sadly these people are dying off? Well, speaking for uh, Steppenwolf, we were of course aware of every news flash, you know, about Janice and, and Jim in France and Jimmy in uh, the UK, and it it hit pretty hard. It wasn't so much an admonition for us to curb our own ways because we really none of the band members uh, in the Wolf 
were really uh, abusing drugs to the extent where they were completely, um, you know, off the charts in terms of being able to perform their musical duties, as it were. But um, there were, uh, you know, personality conflicts after a while. And, uh, you know, it, it was just a mix of different personalities and, and preferences of lifestyles that were not always harmonious, you know, and it doesn't always result in uh, quality of musical efforts. So it was kind of up and down. What happened later in uh, after the uh, mid 70s reunification was that a couple of ex Steppenwolf members were out there touring as Steppenwolf because they were living hand to mouth. And that in turn caused a diminishing of the Steppenwolf brand and caused me to uh, go on the road in 1980 as John Kay and Steppenwolf simply to combat those kind <laughs> of uh, bogus Steppenwolf versions, as I called them. But we had no idea how badly the name had been damaged. And so we had to start over again in the clubs. I mean, I remember a kid in Minneapolis walking up to me saying, you're not John Kay, you wouldn't pay a shithole like this. <laughs> so really? You know? And so that's where we had to start over yeah. again, right? Yeah. Uh, on that level. And I kept, the mantra was, I said to the guys, listen, those 500 people here tonight, forget about, you know, playing uh, the arenas, you know, less than 18 months ago. Right now we're in this space. There are 500 people here wall to wall. Our job is to send them home smiling so that they s send the word out, you guys missed a great show. And word will spread. And it was true, but it took several years for us to work ourselves back up into theaters, amphitheaters, etc. And it was during this period of resurgence and the loyalty of our fan base that I then came during a trip to Africa in 2004. You know, um, there, there's a, a marker in Tanzania where two dirt roads cross. And I, that was on our last day there, and it read, Michael Grisman, he gave all he possessed, including his life for the wild animals of Africa. And Yuta and I talked about that and said, you know, that is where our life is being redirected to. So Steppenwolf now will become the entity that continues to finance our foundation so that we in turn can help on an annual basis with donations and contributions to the now, by then, 15 different people and NGOs that we support. This, let, let's just walk through, walk all of us through uh, the writing, the thoughts, the, the, the point of, I, I mean, the three obviously huge hits. Born to be Wild was written by someone else. Was it ever intended to be what it turned out to be? To have anything whatsoever to do with motorcycles or any of that stuff? Like we no. all want to believe? No? no, I knew you were going to say that. Well, you know, because <laughs> here's the, you know, it's another one of those things, you know, is first of all, when you get someone saying, born to be wild, you know, that had a hit written all over to it. Okay. I wish I would have had your crystal ball at the time. It was the third, <laughs> you know, the, the way uh, Mars, previously known as Dennis, who wrote the song, he said, listen, I was, uh, <laughs> you know, he had the, the um, American teenage uh, uh, dream of getting his own car. And believe it or not, what he stooped to buying was a Matador, which mm. is one of the most benign yes. models of, America, of Detroit ever produced, but it gave him the freedom of the open road. You know, and so then he's driving along Hollywood Boulevard and he sees a poster of this motorcyclist from hell bursting <laughs> from below the pavement, through the pavement, and it says, born to ride. And so Mars is living hand to mouth at this point in a small room in a tenement thing. He's got his Telecaster guitar. You can't plug it into the amplifier because he's writing at three in the morning. He can't make any noise. So he's sitting there and these two ideas, born to ride, uh, head out on the highway, born to, you know, and he's writing 
what turned out to be Born to be Wild, but he can't sing it loud. He's practically whispering it. And then he takes the cassette tape of the demo of that song and drops it off at his, our drummer's place. He was living with a, his girlfriend uh, and, and throws it, you know, there's a, a mail slot in the front door. He sticks the cassette through there and he hears the, the uh, 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 Great Dane dog that the girlfriend owns, you know, scratching and barking. And he says, oh, God, the dog ate the tape. But it turns out it didn't. Jerry, the drummer, his brother, brought that tape to our next Steppenwolf rehearsal, which was at 7408 Fountain Avenue in a little garage. And he said, listen to this. And I hear this whispered, get your motor running, head on. I said, really, man, you want to work with that? I said, yeah, <laughs> man, let's kick it around. So let's say it had very, very, very meager beginnings. Yeah. But I yeah. was at that time writing things like The Ostrich, uh, you know, Desperation. We were doing a couple of blues chestnuts like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hoochie Coochie Man. And so we were already writing some topical songs. Um, and the combination of things like Born to be Wild and the album itself meant we were lucky enough to work both sides of the street, meaning we had Born to be Wild and Sookie Sookie and other uh, singles played on the AM hit-oriented radio stations, <laughs> while the entire album was being played on the so-called underground FM stations. And so while the white girls, uh, 16 years old in the Ed Sullivan show, were screaming for us doing Born to be Wild, the <laughs> hippie community and anti-war demonstrators on the campuses and the granola munchers and shroom eaters, they were, you know, hey, man, I love that album. Yeah. So we we had. So, I mean, so o over a period of time, I mean, all the time. I mean, first of all, when Born to Be Wild is adopted, it's the whole the motorcycle thing. Are you just laughing under your breath, thinking, "Are you kidding me?" If you guys had any idea what this is really about, some guy in a matador. It didn't did matter because the next sequence of that song becoming enshrined was when our management was contacted by Peter and. And Dennis and saying, we're, we're making this film um, called Easy Rider, and we'd love to use two of your songs. Uh, we'd like you to come and, and, and see a screening of it. <laughs> uh, and by the way, we don't have any money. And I said, well, okay, let's go see it. And there we were, I think uh, Robbie from, from the band, Ro uh, Robertson was there, and, and Hendrix, and, you know, and others whose music, uh, Dennis Hopper and Peter uh, Fonda wanted to use in the film. And we sat through this private screening and we were stunned by this film. And we basically said to our managers, I know they said they don't have any money, work something out with them because we want to be part of this. Well, as it turned out, that film was released shortly thereafter. It was actually not the first film we were in. There was a film called Candy that was based on a hugely successful paperback book about this young vixen, you know, and so on and so forth. And that film had Ringo Starr, Richard Burton, um, who, who else? Marlon Brando. And uh, they wanted to use Magic Carpet Ride, which they did. And they asked us to write another song for the film, which I did, which is called Rock Me. Yeah. And so on the heels of that came Easy Rider. But Easy Rider became hugely successful around the world as a film, of course, and introduced our music to parts of uh, the world where we had never played before. And it kind of was a gateway for us to go to Western Europe and elsewhere because the locals knew, oh, yeah, the guys who have the songs in Easy Rider. So from that time on, uh, it helped us on, on, on that level, but more importantly, the film became iconic to the biker community, and they in turn adapted, uh, adopted Steppenwolf as their band. And we played numerous, you know, um, whether it was Bike Week uh, in Sturgis, South uh, Dakota, or um, when they had a similar event in Daytona Beach, uh, Florida, 
and dozens of other um, local or regional events. So they were solidly in our corner, the bikers. But we also had the, the people who were on the college campuses demonstrating against the war and uh, civil rights and other things when we had our monster album released, which was a political social concept album. They were the ones who said that album reflected what concerned me, uh, you know, and, and so that album, I remember when uh, in 2008, uh, when we had the Great Recession, there were more and more of our fans saying, please start playing Monster again, because it seems to be almost prophetic in terms of what the country is going through now. Even Bill Fricky from Rolling Stone reassessed it. And so we had different segments in our listenership. There were definitely the bikers. There were uh, the ones who, you know, were um, from the hippie community. And collectively, so, so they you, saw to it that we were able to go through the ups and downs. E e even with, decade. well, I mean, so was it starting to become a hit on the street and through the community before? And then radio said, we've got to play that. I mean, what was it like in those times and the pushback, the counter? There was the counterculture, but there had to be sort of mainstream pushback against groups like yours. What was How difficult was it to get radio airplay at that time for songs like you were producing? Well, for, for AM, uh, we usually didn't have any difficulties because, you know, Magic Carpet, Born to be Wild, Rock Me, uh, you know, others that made it into the top 20 or so were not really controversial. Uh, what got strange was that um, one time we had on a 707 album a song called uh, more of a ballad feel called Snow Blind Friend, which Hoyt Axton the writer of The Pusher and Joy to the World and Never Been to Spain and other things, had written about a young guitarist that used to work with him. And that young guitarist had also become a friend of mine when I first came to California. And Snowblind Friend was a tragic story of someone who um, succumbed to the drugs. And so that song was really a... a kind of a warning about hard drugs. And yet they would not play it because they being AM radio, FM had no problem with it, but AM wouldn't play it because it was a drug song. And these were the same people who asked me to record a public service, service announcement warning young people against the use of drugs. You know, you were running into this kind of mental I don't know what was at work there, but it, th that sort of nonsense was there. We did have others, uh, such as the aforementioned Vice President Spiro Agnew, <laughs> who singled out uh, <laughs> White Rabbit uh, by the, you know, Jefferson Airplane, yeah. and uh, Don't Step on the Grass, Sam, uh, by um, Steppenwolf as being uh, songs about drugs. And, you know, it, it was just... But we, we really uh, did not, by and large, run into too much pushback. The one incident that we ran into that threw us for a loop was that we arrived in Winston-Salem to play an arena that was sold out, and we were met at the airport by the mayor and the police uh, chief, and we were informed that a local um, preacher was running for local office, who had taken great exception to Steppenwolf lyrics and wanted us to be barred from playing there and uh, had a laundry list of songs that we were not to play at this uh, arena if, in fact, we did perform there. And so it was a tug of war back and forth. And we said, listen, our publicity people would love to get a hold of this story. So, so after much back and forth, they said, well, all right, here's the deal. I'll play what you want, except for the pusher. Okay, why the pusher? Well, the pusher said, you got, you know, you're screaming in there, God damn the pusher so many times. I said, look, the, the Baptist, one of the Baptist uh, newspapers has an article recently in which they say, uh, God damn the pusher is not to be taken the wrong way. It is literally someone using goddamn in the biblical sense. Right. May God damn the pusher for what he does. Well, they wouldn't hear any of it. Okay. And then I said, okay, let me whittle this down. You're saying 
It's goddamn that's the problem. Yes. Okay. And they said, well, fine. So we're going to perform. He said, now be aware. We're going to have a cop standing behind the amplifiers. The moment you say that once, they pull the plug, they're going to arrest you. Okay, fine. We go. We play the whole oh, show. The cops are by the amplifiers? What's that? The cops are behind the amplifiers. Yeah, they have the, the cops are behind. So they're on stage. Line. They're hiding on stage. Yeah, they were standing yeah. there. They're ready. <laughs> well, what were you? So throw, what, what, were they going to stop you in the moment? They were going to the moment I sang. God damn, yank the power. Okay, <laughs> so we're, we're we're playing the show, right? <laughs> and we often played uh, the pusher as an encore. So we play the whole show. The uh, crowd is really enthusiastic. John, did you write? Did you write the pusher? No, it was written by Hoyt Axton. Okay. Hoyt Axton wrote Got it. Snowblind Friend, The Pusher, yep. Never Been to Spain, Joint of the World. Absolutely. He, was a, he became a friend. He was influential on me when I was a kid hanging out at the Troubadour. So I go back up there and I say to the crowd, we had a chance here today to cancel this show and send a lot of people home disappointed. Uh, or make a uh, come to an agreement, which uh, we have done, and that is that there are two two words, uh, a couple of words in this song we're about to play, which I promise not to sing. However, <laughs> I made no such promise on your behalf, and every time I would have sung, God damn the pusher, six thousand kids were singing. <laughs> <laughs> I was not arrested. There was a lot of bl uh, red faces backstage, but we got the song done. Nice. Nice. Is that the craziest thing that happened? What's the craziest thing that happened during a performance or backstage of a performance? And even at the time, you just shook your head and said, are you kidding me? Well, you know, we, we were playing uh, Bill Graham's uh, Fillmore East for the umpteenth time, and... Uh, it happened to be Easter, which was the excuse given by the offending person after that. And we're about to do our last show. You play two shows uh, a night on Friday, another two on Saturday. Uh, we're about to start the first thing. And I look to my right where the bass player is. And I see an apparition. The bass player is clad only yeah. in a sequined jockstrap. And he has a kind of cowling thing uh, <laughs> with rabbit ears on his head. As he explained to me later, after all, it's Easter. Uh, <clears throat> now, the problem is he's uh, spiking on whatever drug he was on. And further to that, the this cowling headdress thing is over his ears. Yeah. And he can't really hear well. And he realizes that he's out of tune. <laughs> so before we play the first note, he asks me to tune his bass while the audience is watching this. Our drummer puts his feet up on his Tom Tom and says, yeah, tricks are for kids. Yeah. So I help him, you know, tune his bass and I'm glowering at him. We play that show and the moment the last note is played, that offending person had the good sense to have made a quick getaway because I went looking for him. Yeah. Uh, uh, needless to say, that was the last show he ever played with Seven yeah, So I they were. How, I don't know how at that time somebody finds a sequin jockstrap. That's uh, that's pretty innovative, right there. Well, at least uh, it, it had some <laughs> bling bling on it, you know. I mean, he had a sense of fashion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, that's the sort of thing that was. Yeah, I know the cast of hair was doing songs totally naked. You know, these were the times, but. Um, there was a certain limit to even uh, what rock and roll could work with, you know, I'd yeah. at least do the music right, you know. Um, this has been great. I don't want to miss a chance for you to not plug your organization, your charitable cause, because it is great. And people that have not seen your documentary, I highly encourage them to check it out. But give people an idea about the organization and, and, and where they can donate. I appreciate that uh, opportunity. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned a little while ago, our foundation, which uh, is named Maui K Foundation, Maui is the maiden name of Virta, and K, of course, is me. 
So it's M-A-U-E-K-A-Y dot O-R-G. That's the website for our foundation. And basically, uh, it is a family foundation that has grown over the years simply because there are so many people out there who have dedicated their lives to preserving our remaining living treasures. And it's our really our privilege to be able to lend a hand. Now, we have been immersed through numerous um, uh, journeys to, to East Africa and Borneo, where, um, you know, orangutans are, are being killed because of palm oil plantations and all sorts of other things. We have been inspired by people who have dedicated their lives to doing this important work. And we have felt the magic of being surrounded, for instance, by a whole herd of elephants who trust um, uh, the Save the Elephants uh, uh, vehicles uh, out there in Samburu section of uh, Kenya. And to witness entire herds that accept us as though we, you know, we're just part of the scenery and who come up to us and, and stick, you know, where we could touch them, they check their, us out with their trunks. And it, it's magical. You, you're never really quite the same again. And you learn over time from the experts how important, in this case, the elephants are. They are key stone species. They are the gardeners of Eden. They are the ones who see to it that the forests don't overgrow the savanna. Because when that happens, all the grazing animals, all the you know, of which there are a dozen species, they will disappear. They have nowhere to graze. And so elephants are at the top of this pyramid of, you know, uh, and numerous other predators and so on. And there's so many people. In fact, yesterday here at our home, we were visited by one of these amazing people. His name is Damien Mander. He has an entity called the International Anti-Poaching Fund. He has uh, been active in Zimbabwe. He's originally from Australia. He was a um, special uh, forces, uh, heavily trained guy. He was in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he's trained rangers uh, to protect the wildlife in Zimbabwe. And he and I had a great meeting yesterday. He has an amazing thing going on, by the way, there that... Um, um, what's his name? The guy, uh, the the director of Avatar and uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, you know, the, some of the other really in incredible films. He made this little film for him and it's called Akashinga, which means the brave ones. And it's about women, women rangers. This thing is available on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, like 15 minutes long. And it is this incredible story of these women who are, trained to be tough as nails and Damien's standing there in front of him and say this work you it may kill you but you know it's I mean it's just there are people out there who are so dedicated to preserving what remains that uh, it's truly humbling and so we try to do our best to support to best uh, you know our ability and uh, there have been many many people who have seen fit to, uh, you know, find a few extra ducats in their wallet and to uh, donate on our uh, website. And I w want to say that don't feel that um, uh, modest uh, uh, contributions don't matter. They do. Every uh, dollar counts. Five bucks might buy a mosquito net for some child that will never be infected with malaria. So don't be uh, fooled into believing that your buck or two doesn't play a role. As uh, Edmund Burke said, Jesus, 200 years ago, no one made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. John, this has been fantastic. Good talking to you. Thank you for the time. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I've enjoyed it.